I'm part of Be Present Honey, and we're going to talk about beekeeping 101. Um, so if you've been a beekeeper already, a lot of this is going to seem pretty basic. This is primarily if you've never done any and you have an interest in maybe getting started, we're going to kind of go over some of that stuff today. So a bit about us, Be Present Honey, uh, between my wife and I, we have about 17 years of experience beekeeping. Uh, my wife uh, showed me everything I know. She's the queen bee, as I call her. Um, we have a table upstairs, so if at the end of this, if we don't, if there's not enough time to answer any of your, all of your questions, please feel free to come up to us at the table and ask away. We love talking about this stuff, so we're always happy to answer any questions. Um, so there's reasons why you want, might, might want to become a beekeeper. Uh, saving the bees is a big thing. Obviously, the honeybees are facing a lot of issues and a lot of problems, and anything that we can do to help them out is great for both them and the environment. Um, sometimes people just want to look for a new hobby, something that's fun to do. It's fairly easy. Sometimes when you first get started, it can be a bit more intensive. But once you've gotten things going, like checking the hive really isn't that difficult, that sort of thing. Once you get started, it's not too bad. Uh, same thing with the inexpensive. It's, it's a bit of an investment to begin with to buy the equipment and like the suits and all that. But once you have that stuff, there's not a lot that you need to be spending like throughout the season or every year, as so long as your bees are surviving and everything. Uh, helping pollinators and connecting with nature in general for other great reasons. Um, it's not that time consuming. Like you don't want to check the hive every day like, or even every week. We'll check it every few weeks once we've got things established. And so, you know, it's not like it takes up all of our time. And of course, to get honey. That's one of the most popular reasons people get into it because there's nothing better than honey from your own hive. So we're gonna cover a couple topics. The calendar is kind of how we're gonna frame everything. We're gonna look at the beginning of the year and all throughout the year and that's gonna sort of uh, inform everything else that we talk about, including the equipment that we need, setting up, where to get bees, and helping other pollinators. So you can start now that's possible, but it's easier if you get started a little bit earlier in the year. So there's things that we recommend doing before you just get right into it. Like finding a mentor is really helpful or shadowing another beekeeper. Like having an established beekeeper, maybe with a location that you can keep a hive of your own so that when they go out to tend their bees, you can go out and tend yours with them. Kind of make, it's like learning on the go as opposed to getting your own set up at your own property and not having a mentor. There's plenty of stuff to look up online. There's always great resources there, but it's fantastic to have someone that you can talk to as you're doing it. Reading, like before you get started, like over the winter months, reading everything you can, joining local and state organizations. We've got a couple there. A2B2 is the Ann Arbor Be uh, Backyard Beekeepers. Uh, MBA is Michigan Beekeepers Association, and SEMBA is the Southeastern Michigan Beekeepers Association. Those are all great uh, resources. They've got great online presences, so you can check with them. Like they'll have events happening or meetings, lessons, and they'll also have some B schools. Now, B school could be a place where you go and you take some lessons, you learn about it, and you've got your hive there. Like it could be an established farm or an established beekeeper who does a lot of educating. You go, you learn about it, and then you take care of your bees there. So it's more like almost like a lab experience at school. So like I said, we're going to look through a calendar basically starting at the beginning of the year. So in January and February, like if you don't have bees, there's nothing to do in the bee yard because we're in Michigan. If you live in an area where it's warm all year round, this is going to be a bit different. But because that's definitely not Michigan, during winter, even if you have bees, we tend to leave them alone. We, don't, we definitely don't want to like open things up during winter, have all the cold rush in or anything. So before you start, January and February are a great time to learn about new things. Like there's plenty of books about it. Beekeeping for Dummies is a great one too. I know the For Dummies book sounds kind of insultive, but they're solid books. They're, they're for people who genuinely want to learn something and they're great. Uh, conferences, lectures, learning events at your local club, any of those things that can be great resources. Like when those groups get together, they'll have some topics and lectures that are more advanced beekeeping genetics or things like that, but they'll also have more basic stuff, things like uh, how to catch a swarm or how to overwinter or just basic equipment. So there's always, always good things to look at for those. 
and then looking for vendors that will sell the equipment and the bees that you'll need. We recommend starting out with two hives. If it's on your property, you know, if you're doing a bee school or something, one hive might be fine if you're going and just learning. But having two hives means that if there's a problem with one, you've still got the other, and you have a chance to see like two different hives as they're, as they're growing and, and producing. So mid to late winter is a great time to start getting your equipment. And we have a, a diagram of a, of a hive and different items. We've got a little mini one here. Obviously, the real ones are bigger. Um, but there's a lot of different pieces that go into it. There's a bottom board, and there's like a bottom screen. These are called supers, and then like the top inner and outer cover for ventilation. Now in the supers, there's different sizes. Like this would be a deep, this is a medium, and they usually have between eight and 10 of these frames inside. And this is where the bees will you know, produce their honey, uh, produce uh, larva and everything. Some of these come like this, where it's empty. Some of them will come with foundation, where there's either wax or a plastic kind of sheet straight up and down to kind of act as like a, a template for the bees to make sure that they're doing it, do, you know, building straight up and down. The bees are pretty good at doing it straight up and down, even without it. They do something called festooning, where they're holding hands and hanging down and producing the wax. But foundation can make it straighter. We don't like using it because we harvest the wax too and uh, we can't do that if there's a foundation on it. But a lot of people will sell foundation. A lot of people like to use it. We use mediums. We don't use deeps because when you have a whole lot of frames that are full, uh, a deep can get pretty heavy and our backs are not getting any better. So we like the mediums for that. But there's plenty of other you know, people that like using deeps or some that have more, more frames. And then there's of course plenty of actual equipment. Like the bee suit is the most well-known and visible of all of those. And there's a bunch of different kinds of those. We have some that cover the whole body. We have some that are just like the top and you wear it with pants or something, or it's just a veil, veil and gloves. And of course, there's a few beekeepers that don't use any of that. They just go out into the yard and they're not bothered by anything. We are not those people. Um, we, uh, you know, we're pretty calm around the bees, but we like having the protection. We like to make sure that we're not doing anything to mess with them and we're not getting stung. And we've both been stung a number of times, a couple times, but uh, we like having the protection. <laughs> uh, gloves, boots, even if you have like a windbreaker, something that like uh, is tight around the, the wrists or the waist that kind of help keep bees from getting inside. A hive tool, which kind of looks like a cross between uh, like a, a wedge. It's basically like a piece of metal that's got a couple sharp edges for like prying things apart because as the bees start making stuff, they'll propolize, which is a bee type of cement. Like they'll create this stuff that seals everything in, which is fantastic because it makes it more weatherproof, weather, uh, weather tight, but it makes it a lot harder to open things up. So like you need a hive tool to be able to pry the supers apart and to get some of those frames out. And of course a smoker. Uh, having a smoker is great because we don't want to make the bees any more agitated than they are. Like calm bees are great bees. We don't want to get stung, but we don't want them to sting us because that means that those bees die. And we want the bees to stay alive as much as possible, obviously. So in March, uh, that's a good time. Like if you've got your equipment, like if you've got your supers, you can start painting them. You can decorate them however you want so long as the paint is like an outdoor grade so that, you know, it's weatherproof that's fine. You don't want it to just be the naked wood because then it can start seeping in. A lot more moisture can get inside. Having like some kind of protective coating is great for the hive. And it makes it look kind of attractive too. Finding where you put it is a big deal too. Like you want to make sure it's not an area where lots of people are going to be walking by. One that's going to freak people out. But you also don't want people messing with them or getting too close if you can't keep an eye on them. Plenty of sun is a real big deal. We want them to get lots of sun to keep the warmth. And something else that's important, like if you're in this area, like more north, having a hive that faces to the south is great because during the winter months when the sun is a little bit south and low, they'll actually get into more heat. It'll help keep the hive a bit warmer during the winter months if it's facing south. But you also want to make sure it's not in an area that's going to get a ton of wind hitting it on the side. 
So having things like windbreakers, like trees or bushes or something that protects it from that is great. Now, you don't want to knock the, the hive over, but you don't want the bees to leave the hive and something get whisked away either. So protection from the wind is, you know, windbreak is great. Um, not prone to flooding. The last thing you want is a hive that is uh, filled with water. Um, I've known a few people who've had uh, hives that get flooded out and it's awful, like the whole colony can collapse and it's really rough. So having it one like on a either a or a not a table, but something that lifts it up is great. Having it in an area where it's not like the land is just coming right down to it. You just want to play. You want to find an area where it will get lots of sun and it's going to stay as dry as possible. And respect your neighbors. If you have neighbors that maybe have uh, allergies to bees, maybe don't put them right on the border between your property and theirs. Um, some places, especially in towns and cities, there's ordinances as to how many hives you're allowed to have. Sometimes if you live in a city, it's a maximum of two. If you live out more like in the countryside, you can have a lot more, but you still don't want to put it where it's going to make neighbors nervous because you want to establish good relations with your neighbors. You want to make sure, you know, you can always bribe them with some free honey. That sometimes helps grease the wheels so they don't mind having all those hives out there. Um, if they've got lots of flowers or crops, it's also great for them because they'll have free pollinators, which will just help their crops. A couple places to get bees. Buying them is probably how you'll start out. You can buy a package or a nuke, as they're called, like up there on the top right here. This is a nuke or a nucleus colony. You can get one of those for about 150 to 300, depending on the type of bees you're getting and um, the size of the nuke. Like a lot of the ones that we get, they have about five frames in them and it's called a nuclear colony because it's got a fully functioning bee colony in there. It's got its own queen and its own workers and drones and they may have even started building up some stuff in the, uh, the frames. Like it's possible if it's a mated queen, she may already be laying some eggs. The other way, another thing for this is Sometimes it makes it more expensive. Like if you're buying it from a Michigan beekeeper, you're buying bees that have already overwintered in Michigan. And that can be great because those are bees that are hardier. They have a better chance of overwintering for you. Um, and it means that they're not coming from a longer distance. If you get something like a package, most of those are gonna be from other areas. Like a lot, like Georgia sells a lot of packages. And those bees are fine, but they've obviously never overwintered. So it might be a little bit more difficult for them to get through a winter. The other thing with the package, and you buy like two or three pounds of bees at a time, and it's just a whole lot of bees in the box like this with some ventilation, they'll have a queen in there, but it's not their queen. When people make packages, they're basically dumping bees into a box, catching a queen, like they'll be rearing queens themselves, and having the queen in its own little cage inside to protect the queen. Since the queen doesn't belong to those bees yet, they might be very aggressive towards her. So that cage gives her some time to fan out her pheromones, get those bees used to her. So when you get like a package, literally like that, you just dump the bees into the hive, you take the queen cage, put that in the hive, and then a couple of days later, you check back on it. The little queen cage has like a little block of sugar that allows her to eat from one end and the other bees from the other. And by the time they get through it, they're used to that queen, they've accepted her as a queen, and now you've got an actual colony. If that hasn't happened, then you go in and you unplug it yourself, make sure the queen gets in there. So a package can be easier, but it does take a little bit of a couple extra steps to make sure that those bees accept the queen that you, they've, they've got. Whereas with a the nuke, they've already, that's already their queen. So once you get that, you can just take those frames, put it right into a beehive. Catching a swarm is not a great way to start. <laughs> um, it's fantastic to do so, but there's no telling when you're gonna get one. With ordering nukes or, or packages, you know when the bees are coming. You know it's gonna be on this date. You can have your hive yard, your setup, everything ready. You get the package or the nuke, you bring it home, you set it up. Once you've got some more space, hives or swarms are great because it's free bees. So we actually just call, called yesterday to pick up a swarm, and we're gonna go back today to see if we've successfully done it. But a swarm is just bees that are looking for a new home. 
So let's say their hive is doing really well and there's just not enough space. The queen may decide it's time for some of us to move out. So they'll do their own split. Some of the bees will stay behind, but the queen and most of the bees will leave and look for a new home. And they'll often like hang out on a branch like this in the big clump while they send out scouts to go looking for a good home and then they'll move in. So if we see something like this, we'll actually come with a box like that underneath it, either cut the branch or shake it, get all the bees in there, close it up. And so long as we have the queen in there, the rest of the bees will go right into the box. But again, there's no telling when you're gonna get that. It can be pretty intimidating if you've never uh, been a beekeeper before. It's not something that I would try doing like your first year out. Uh, late spring, summer, now that you've got your bees, you wanna check them. And you never wanna just open them up just for the heck of it. You always wanna make sure you've got a real reason to check on them because the more you disturb them, the more disturbed they are. Like the less they're gonna be productive, you know, the more agitated they're gonna become. But we do need to check them because we have to make sure they're doing okay. So a few things that we'll check for is to make sure that they've got food, that they're starting to actually collect food on their own, that they've got brood, a queen, and if they need more room. Now I'm terrible at spotting queens. My wife is great at it. I don't know how she does it. So like she'll show me, here's the queen. I'll say, okay, but it's never the other way around. Um, so part of it's my eyesight's not getting better. But if you see larva, you don't need to spot a queen because you know there's a queen in there. You can spot eggs or larva or brood. That's great. If you don't see that but you do see a queen, that's great too because you know that there's a queen in there. So either seeing larva or a queen shows that there is proof of a queen that is laying eggs and helping raise the colony. And then making sure that they have food is making sure that they are healthy. Now, a lot of hives, you can put like something on the front that's like a food jar. It's like sugar water, basically. And if it's a new hive, like if you've just started, it's great to give them some extra food or sometimes near the end of the season going into winter, making sure they've got some extra food is great. It's not as good as the pollen and nectar they collect from the flowers and they make in the honey. That's the best for them. But if they need it, we want to make sure they've got some food. That's more important, obviously, than starving. And it's good to check about more room because if it's getting packed in here in this hive, they may swarm. And you don't like it when bees swarm away from you because then you've lost a lot of bees. Some will stay and they'll make a new queen, but now you've got a hive that has much fewer bees. And if it's late in the season, they've got a much uh, slimmer chance of actually surviving the winter because they don't have enough time with the bees they have to build up enough stores. So we always try and make sure that we, we catch them before they swarm. So we can either add another super, like put another box on top to give them more space, or we can do a split. You can actually split a hive in half and create two smaller hives. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Like, so the darker um, filled hexagon? Like this? Yeah. Yeah. So what is that? What's These are eggs. Okay, so the egg is on. Yeah, the eggs so are. What makes it dark? What makes it dark is it's, this is probably comb that's been used a lot. Like when they, when they use, they'll reuse comb over and over again. And the more they use it, the darker it gets. Sometimes it's just the amount of bees walking over it. Um, you know, or like if they've had dark pollen, that can start staining the wax a little bit if they've used that for storage. Just having it dark isn't a problem. There are, you know, sometimes if it's dark, it could be another issue, but like this, if you see something like this with like a single egg in there, this is a good sign. And actually this makes it way easier to spot than it usually is. Like if it's like these, that's something else I can't see when I'm looking through. I can spot the larva, they're bigger. Eggs, I can't see those. Um, again, my wife has much better eyes or at least better glasses than I do. So she can spot eggs, but I can spot larva. And you can also tell brood pattern like these right here, when it's capped like this, these are actually um, brood that have been sealed up. When they go into their pupa stage, they cover them with wax to let them develop and gain all like the legs and other features sort of in private before they actually become an adult and climb back out. So looking for this, and right here, let's see, queen right here. So she's not much uh, like thicker than the regular bees, she's just longer. 
Now, when you buy something else, uh, when you buy a nuke or a package that can increase the price is if they mark the queen. Sometimes they'll put like a little dab of color like on the thorax of the queen and that can make her a lot easier to spot when you're looking at the, when you're pulling the bees out and taking a look. And it also lets you know if they've made a new queen. Like if you find a queen that doesn't have the spot in there, it means either that queen has left or that queen had some issues and they decided to replace her with a new one. Um, but having that little extra color can cost a bit more because of, it's a little bit of extra work for the people raising the queens. Um, checking for food, like if you see liquid, that's gonna be nectar. It's not honey yet. They fill it with nectar, they'll fan it with their wings to dry it out, and once it becomes honey like that, then they'll actually seal it or cover it, and that's this stuff. That's usually like a white coating. It's not as like uh, delineated as brood patch. It's lighter color, and it's just like a, almost like a sheet. Um, it's also heavier. Like if you have a frame that's full of honey, you can definitely feel it. It's a lot more weight to it. And that's why we use the, not the deeps, because lots of honey actually hurts our backs. So a closer look. Now this would be a frame that's doing really well. Like we've got a lot of brood pat. Like we want this as a, brood, a good brood pattern. This is all brood, and we like it when it's all like center and spread out, not patchy. If it's patchy, it might not be bad, but it could also mean that it's a queen who's not doing as well as like a real healthy, strong queen. This is a much stronger thing to see because it means, one, she's producing a lot and she's doing it as she goes. Like she's not going over here, doing some here. Like this is all going well. So this is fantastic if you can see this. You like to make sure the bees are calm after you smoke them. When you smoke bees, it kind of gives them, uh, it calms them for a couple of reasons. One, since they all communicate by pheromones, it dulls some of the pheromones so there's less chance that they're gonna be alarmed. But also smoke makes them think fire. And if they think that, they'll start gorging themselves on honey and that also slows them down and calms them. So smokers are important when we're opening up a hive to check on them because it lessens their agitation. But if they're still really agitated after smoking them, there could be another issue with the bees. The buzz or hum of the hive is calm. That's harder to tell the difference when you get started. I mean, you can tell when you've opened up a hive and you've smoked it and you're working it, you can tell when they're getting a bit angry. Like if they're pinging your suit a lot more, they're not happy. You know, they're trying to see what's going on, who are you, do we need to sting you? You know, please go away. Or if they're doing really well, like if they've got a queen that's doing great, they've got a lot of stores, they may be calmer naturally. And so you smoke them and you're doing stuff and they seem to be like, okay, you know, don't hurt us, but we're, we're doing okay here. Like we're watching you, but they're not super angry. And then again, pollen, nectar, and frames with honey. If we see some of that, that means that they've been collecting food and that they're creating the honey and that's very important for them. You always wanna see that. You wanna make sure that they are producing new bees, but also making sure that they are collecting the stuff they need to survive. So there are plenty of things that can hurt a hive, and it's very helpful to be able to spot some of those. Some are really hard to see, some are easier than others. Like, one thing that's really hurting bees around here are these things called varroa mites. They can be tough to spot, especially if you've never seen them, but there's these little red mites that will attach themselves to the back of bees, especially as they're forming in the, high, in the, in the cell, and they'll eat like fat cells, which means when the bee becomes an adult, it's maybe got deformed wings or it's not gonna do very well. Like a lot of uh, mites can really weaken a hive. That's another reason the hive might swarm. If they've got a lot of pests or something and they are not able to deal with it, they may leave to try and find another home that's like mite free. You really don't wanna see anything in the hive other than bees. So like if there's hive beetles that you don't wanna see, sometimes you can get ants. The bees are pretty good at dealing with those Hive beetles are a problem, but then uh, if you see comb like this, where it looks kind of grainy or it just looks dark, but more like sickly, it could be like a hive disease or a fungus infection. Now it's another great reason to have a mentor or like talking or having someone that you're shadowing, because if you do see something like this, you can ask them and they'll have a better eye for that. 
because like I said, a lot of uh, comb that have been, that's been used over and over again is gonna start getting dark anyway. So dark comb alone isn't too bad, but when it looks dark and patchy like this, or you see cells filled with you know, white stuff that doesn't look like a real larva, that's a problem, that can be a disease. There's things like American fowl brood or chalk brood. Most of those things you'll kind of read as you go. Brood patterns like this aren't great um, because it's like the queen is not like staying on track, she's kind of wandering around. Also, if you see cells with multiple eggs in them, that means you do not have a queen, you've got a worker that is laying eggs. And the problem with that is a worker is never mated, so the eggs are not uh, fertilized, which means they're just gonna get drones. And while drones are important, you don't need very many of them, because they don't do any work. The drones are the boy bees. You want one egg per cell. The workers, the female bees, do all the work. The males are good for one thing only, and that's trying to find a queen from a different hive to mate with. And if they succeed, they die. And if they don't succeed, they get kicked out of the hive at the end of the season anyway, because all they're doing is eating food during the winter. So we don't like seeing laying workers, because that means you're just gonna get tons and tons of drones, and you don't actually have a queen that's making you viable bees. Uh, sometimes if you see, like here we have different kinds of brood. Worker brood is more flat. The drone brood, because they're fatter bees, they stick out a bit more. Now you want some of them, but you don't want a ton of it. Like if you're seeing just nothing but drone brood, that's another issue. That means the hive's not gonna do as well because they're not gonna have as many workers. So having some of these popcorn looking drone brood is great, but mostly what you want is like these flat kind of even surfaced worker brood. Now a queen cell is even larger. That sticks out even further than this. And that means that they're growing a new queen, either because they wanna replace the queen they have or they're getting ready to swarm. So that alone isn't a bad thing necessarily. Like if the queen needs to be replaced, it's good that the hive is gonna replace her. If it's a swarm cell, and you can tell those usually because they're gonna be like at the bottom, a lot of times swarm cells will be kind of at the bottom of a frame. Then you might wanna give them more space. Make sure that they've got enough space to make them less interested in swarming because then you're gonna have a lot of bees going away. So late things through summer, uh, swarm prevention, like I said, making sure they've got enough space, that you don't see that they're producing extra queens or anything like that. Um, you can add supers when like a lot of the frames are drawn, that means they've got wax and they're, that they're filled with either food or brood. You wanna make sure they've got room to build more and cells, the empty cells that they can fill. So you, you, know, you add another super with empty frames. And you can also make splits. Now, so that's something you do, like if the hive is doing really well and you don't have very many colonies, like you wanna try and increase the number of colonies, you can actually set up a new hive and take some of the frames from one, put it in the new hive, and the new hive will make their own queen. Like the bees will know if they don't have a queen and they will start creating one. They do that by uh, feeding like a worker uh, uh, larva this stuff called royal jelly throughout its whole development and that will actually develop it into a queen. And they'll make a few queens to try and hedge their bets so that whatever queen uh, hatches first basically wins because they can only have one queen. So when you do a split, you wanna make sure each new hive is gonna have some brood and some food frames. So you wanna make sure that they've got baby bees and stuff to feed the bees with. Only one is gonna have the actual original queen, probably the original hive. You kinda wanna leave her undisturbed. But if you can't spot the queen, you know, and she might make it into the other one, that's actually okay too, because then this hive will make their own queen. Um, it's just nice to not disturb the queen if you can, but either hive can make their own. You don't wanna split too late in the season, like too close to winter or fall because they're not gonna have as much time to build up resources and stores in that smaller hive. Since it's a split, they've got less bees and less stores for each one. So it's something that you want to do late spring or early summer. Like if you've got a really robust hive, a split can be great. If it's close to when you might be harvesting, it's better to just give them an extra space, not split them because 
they're not going to be able to work hard enough to gain enough stores to survive a winter. And the harvest, which is a lot of the people's favorite part. When you're collecting the honey, or in our case also sometimes the wax, there's a few different ways you can do it. What we do is we'll actually go through the supers, we'll pick out some frames that are just food, just honey frames. We'll take those. If they're brewed, then we'll leave them. We don't want to collect those. If it's like half and half, we'll probably leave those too. Because since we take the wax, we cut all of it out and mash it. And then we strain it and we get the honey out from there. And then the wax, we can melt down, filter that a few times to render it. And we use the wax to make things like lip balms or wax food wraps, stuff that we have on sale upstairs. And the honey, of course, we use as honey. Uh, but a lot of people will use like a, a one of these knives, like an electric a heated knife, and they'll kind of take the blade down the side and cut the caps off to uncap all that honey. And then the honey will drain, or they'll put it in an extractor, which basically spins it around using centrifugal forces to kick all the honey to the side. That drips down. And then you've got the, uh, the honeycomb that is now empty. And you can take that frame, put it back in a beehive, and they've got you know, honeycomb that's already made. They don't have to make any new ones. They just have to fill it. Again, we collect the wax, so we don't use an extractor, but we always make sure we leave plenty of food. You never want to take too much, because since these bees have to overwinter here, they have to have food stores that they can eat during the winter. They don't hibernate. What the bees will do is they'll form a cluster around the queen to keep themselves warm by you know, buzzing and beating their, leg, their uh, wings. But they have to have food by them, so like the, you know, the cluster might move a little bit, or if they go too far out, the, uh, the bees will freeze. But they don't go out to forage, so you have to make sure that they've got enough food and enough stores to survive a winter. Some people will add like a top layer that's full of like sugar or sugar candy that gives them some extra food or like some uh, food jar or something like that. That's great too if it helps them if they don't have enough stores. We prefer just giving them more of their own honey. So we don't um, collect as much honey from each hive as we could each year because we want to give our bees the best food that they can get and the best chance for overwintering. Uh, giving back frames, like especially people, and if, if you have frames that have the foundation, then you definitely don't want to like mash it because if it's a plastic foundation, then you want to cut the, the caps off and spin it around because the foundation is going to stay in the frame. And those are great to reuse and put back in. We don't mind the foundation if it's for brood because we're not taking any of that, but we don't like it for the, uh, the food because we do like the wax. We like collecting both. Um, so there's different ways to collect it. Fall and winter prep, at this point, you don't want to take any more from them. You just want to make sure that they are protected and doing well enough for the winter. And some things like that are reducing their entrance. You know, when you have a regular hive and it's doing well, you've got this whole, well, I've got an entrance reducer here, but like this whole uh, slit can be an entrance. Sometimes there's a little one at the top too. But if we want to protect them, like during the fall or winter, we'll put something in here that's got a much smaller opening and that makes it easier for those bees to defend their hive. When the hive is getting started, like when you first get your bees, and when you're getting ready for winter, hive reducers are really important because that's when they're most vulnerable. When they're first starting out or near the end of the season when you may get robbers, like yellow jackets will come in and try and steal baby bees, which they'll take back to, you know, to their hives for food or other things that just try and get the honey. So it makes it a lot easier for those bees to protect themselves if we give them a smaller entrance that they have to protect. We make sure oh, there's other things like mice can get into them. So sometimes you can put these little screens at the front and that'll keep the mice from going through because they're not gonna be able to chew through the metal. Um, insulation can help with overwintering. They do pretty well with the cold, actually. A bigger problem for bees than like really, really frigid temperatures is if in the middle of all that, you get a heat wave or like you get a day that's really nice and sunny and then you have a lot of moisture. You have a lot of the snow and ice melting. And if some of that gets into the hive, then once it freezes again, you may have water that's dripped on bees and then you've got frozen bees. 
they can handle the cold okay, so long as they have the food in the stores, but frozen moisture on them, that can really devastate them. There's things you can put on top, like moisture quilts, which is almost like a, a thinner version of one of these that's got like absorbent wood chips or sawdust in like a pillowcase or something like that. And that can help trap moisture and keep it from going down into the hive. We've used those sometimes, sometimes we haven't. We've found they work or don't. Uh, we really just try and make sure that they have enough stores. That's always been like the best thing for us. Not, you know, we check the parasites and we make sure they've got enough food. Um, you know, make sure that they are, you know, the windbreak, that's again when you were put, first putting the hive out there. During winter, again, you never want to open the hive, but you do want to clear the front of it. It's fine if there's a ton of snow on the top. That's actually not a problem. But if they have lots of snow in the front, that can be an issue because if there is a nice day, they can't get out. And the bees will never go to the bathroom during the winter. They never go to the bathroom in the hive. They'll wait the whole winter until it's warm enough to leave, and then they'll go outside and do their business. And you can tell if they've done that in front of the hive. If you see these like yellow specks on the, in the snow, like these mustard colored specks, that's basically the bees have gone out to use the bathroom. Um, you can also, one thing we do is uh, we get like a thermal camera and we'll rent it actually from here. The Ann Arbor District Library has one that you can check out or a couple. And that's great. We can take that and look at the hive like with predator version, vision. And if we see like a nice warm spot in the middle, that means you've got bees. If it's uniform, cold, yellow like this, that means the bees are probably dead or gone. So it's great a way to check without opening anything up to, to walk around them looking at that. And if you can see like that warmth or a, a colored spot in the middle, that's a great sign. It means you've got bees that are alive and active. Again, always reading and learning up more during the winter because there's less stuff to actively do with them. It's a great time to do that. Decide if you want more hives and then preparing and purchasing more equipment, like if you want to split or buy more bees just getting ready, getting everything ready for the next season. And again, YouTube's a great place. There's tons of stuff on there. Just find, learning as much as you can, going to those conferences, seeing like what maybe didn't work as well this year and kind of planning for the next year, strategizing like, well, they were all really weak. They weren't making enough food. Like, what can we change? What can we do differently? You know, talk to people, ask them, ask them their advice or ask them if you have a mentor. That's always great, because every year we learn more stuff. I mean, my wife, she's the expert, like I said, she's taught me everything I know about bees, but every year we still learn more. New things, new tricks to try, new strategies, things that didn't work out as well the next year, or when we go to the conferences and we'll learn some new stuff too. So it's a constant learning thing. Never feel bad like if you don't know what you're doing, because if you haven't done it before, you're not supposed to. There's no reason for you to, and even if you've done it for a while, that doesn't mean you know everything. We've met a few beekeepers who seem like they do, but there's really always different styles of beekeeping, different philosophies and different ways of doing it. The other thing we want to talk about is just supporting pollinators in general. Honeybees are certainly our favorite, but we like all pollinators, butterflies, ladybugs and other beetles, bumblebees, there's other bees that do it, like this is a, like a bumblebee moth. Butterf you know, uh, fruit bats, well, we don't really have those here, but in general, any, any kind of pollinator is something that we want to encourage. Um, even carpenter bees, which I hate because they eat our house, help pollinate, so I can't hate them too much. They're definitely not my favorite. Even some of the wasps and yellow jackets, they can pollinate. They're not nearly as effective as honeybees, but they will do so. Um, that's still, that said, if we see like a wasp nest on the side of our house, we're not gonna be thrilled like, oh look, pollinators. We're not gonna be happy about that. Uh, planting for pollinators is great. Create, putting a lot of flowers and a lot of plants that different pollinators will like throughout the year, things that bloom at different times of year. So if you like a garden that's got color and that has blooms not just one season, but throughout, that's great for pollinators too because that means that there's gonna be sources of food for them later in the season. Like around here, goldenrod is something that comes up like in late summer, early fall. And a lot of people don't like honey from goldenrod, 
but that's still a great source of food for the bees. So like we'll try and harvest our honey before they start collecting goldenrod pollen, but that's always great to see because it, no, it means they're collecting food for them for the winter. And having things that, that bloom throughout the year means that they'll have a lot more food. And different pollinators are attracted to different things. Like honeybees don't see red, but they're very attracted to like purples, yellows, blues, whereas hummingbirds do like red. Hummingbirds are another great pollinator. Having like a little bee uh, drinking station, like a watering station is great. Um, like just a dish of water with some rocks in it so it's not too deep. It's important for the bees to have a source of water that they don't drown in, but they need to drink too. Um, not using pesticides or weed, you know, weed killers, that kind of thing. That's also extremely helpful. If you wanna keep bees, you really don't wanna use anything like Roundup or any of those chemicals on your yard because that's just gonna hurt the bees. And even if it doesn't kill them outright, if they're collecting pollen and nectar from plants that have been sprayed with that stuff, they're bringing those chemicals back into the hive and that's gonna get into their wax, into their honey. So that means you might be eating honey with some of that stuff if you're using that. So pulling weeds by hand takes a lot more time, but it's still better for the bees than using the chemical sprays. It's also great to have things like clover and dandelions in your yard. A lot of people don't like that in their grass, but bees love it. So having that gives them another thing that they like to enjoy and they like to eat. Now having some areas that maybe isn't the perfect pristine lawn is kind of nice for them too. Did you have your hand up? Yeah. Not like natural stuff to put on it? I mean, yeah, natural stuff in general is better than anything like, I don't know too much about the specifics, but if it's something that's not toxic to us either, then that's good because whatever is on those flowers is gonna end up in the honey as well. So again, if it's something that's natural, that's not toxic to animals, that's gonna be better than anything that you like buy at the store, like a chemical kind of, like, like Roundup is like the real nasty one. Um, not spraying stuff is better, but I mean, you might have other pests that you want to get rid of that are on those flowers. We just want to make sure we're not hurting the bees. Um, let's see, and habitats. Like you've probably seen things like this, these little bee houses, or in this case, a bee hotel. Um, these are great for solitary bees like carpenters or masons, leaf cutters. They're also like, I love this one. I just think it's really cool looking. That gives them a place to, to hang out or to live or to just be at for a little while. You've got like butterfly houses here with these long slits. Uh, of course, hummingbird feeders. It's kind of fun to see those guys around. Anything like that to help local pollinators, aside from honeybees, is also great. So like if you're a beekeeper, cool, and then add a few of those too and you'll have some other good critters around. Uh, supporting local is great. Like if you're buying honey, buy from a local person or a local farm. One, it's gonna be better honey. It's not gonna be like a conglomeration of a bunch of stuff from different countries that's got additives added to it. You can trust it a little bit more. And then you can get to know like a farmer or a local person, how they're getting their honey, how they're doing their beekeeping. So you can know for certain whether or not they use chemicals or how they do it, if it's a place that you would like to support. So it's always great, especially with a lot of any kind of produce, supporting local is always great. So you can follow us on social media. On most of them, we've got Be Present Honey. Um, like I said, we got, I think, uh, a couple minutes for some questions. If, when I leave, we have a table upstairs with Be Present Honey, feel free to come up to us if you have other questions, but yeah. plants I guess you didn't hear um, we you know we collect the honey and the wax do we have any plan to collect the brood and kind of distribute that as like a product and we don't I know um, using insects as a protein source is becoming if not more popular more important um, because they are a great source of protein we don't do that with ours because we just want to make sure they have as much brood as they can for ours like if we had a much bigger yard we have about a dozen hives between 10 to 15 each year. So like right now we've got about a dozen. If we had hundreds or something, maybe we might do some of that. But 
for us, because we are not that big scale, we want to make sure all the brood stays in here. People, some people will collect the pollen or the royal jelly that they'll make, and that stuff has a lot of health uh, benefits too, but it's also a lot harder to collect. And again, with the amount of hives we have, that's pretty labor intensive for like a, a low yield. But like, you can buy pollen, and it's a nice energy boost, and it's, it's good protein um, as well. Yeah? Okay. Sure, like if you buy a hive, like an actual hive from someone, which I didn't mention, that's another way you can get bees. I like actually buy the whole hive from a person. That can be great. Um, sometimes you don't know what condition it was in. Like if you don't know who the person is, they might have some issues in it. Uh, even if they don't, you still want to check it out. Cleaning the hive, it depends on what the, the, uh, the wax looks like. Like I said, if it's just dark, that might mean it's just been used a lot, and that's still fine, especially for brood comb, like for laying the eggs and hatching new bees, because we don't, you know, we don't, we're not gonna eat, like, we're not eating that anyway, it's not like the honey. Um, but checking the frames, once you get a bit more used to looking for problems, like diseases, you can, like, you can cut all the wax out and use, like, a hive tool or a scraper to scrape all the bits off of it if it really doesn't look good. Um, sometimes if we've had a, a frame for a long time and it's just really ugly, we'll cut the wax out um, because we have enough frames, we can give them a new one. Um, if it's a disease, sometimes you have, to, you have to get rid of the whole thing. And I'm not saying that that's what you have, that's not common. Um, but as far as cleaning the, the frame, like. If it's wax you want to get rid of, then yeah, you can just scrape it out with the hive tool and scrape the sides. Sometimes they'll add propolis to the sides too that helps them stick together, and that can make it difficult to put frames back in. So scraping some of that off the side was, is good for leaving some, um, for, for getting those frames back in. You don't want to leave too much space. Like you always want to make sure the frames are nice and close together, because if they're a little bit far apart, they'll build in between, and you might get like what we call wonky comb comb that's not straight up and down, comb that kind of goes this way and that way, and that's a lot harder to get out because you can't just take one frame out without ripping a lot of it apart. So you don't want to leave too much space. Like the frames that are built, they've got like basically spaces already built into it, so you want those nice and close. But otherwise, yeah, it's kind of hard to say without actually seeing the frames what, what you should do, but if they look, like if the, if, the, if the cells look even, if the cells look good, there's a good chance it's fine. Um, if it looks really beat up or chewed up, then you can just get rid of it and have the bees make some new stuff. You know, if they've got their brood in it, you might not want to get rid of that because you don't want to just get rid of like a you know, part of a generation of bees. But as they start hatching or something, you can maybe replace it with something else. Sure. It's not too late. Um, it's harder to start right now because a lot of people that sell bees, they may have already sold out. Like people that sell packages, they ship packages in, or they, pre they prepare nukes from their own hives. A lot of those have already done that by now, but maybe not all of them. What I would do is uh, those places I mentioned before, like A2B2 or MBA, or just go online and look for like local bee groups. And you, that's a great place to look for vendors, people who might be selling and that will tell you whether or not there are people that still have supplies, like actual bees to sell. Um, late spring is usually like, a, or early to late spring is a better time just because you get them early, but it's still possible to do it now. Um, especially if you already have the equipment, if you have a hive and the stuff that goes with it and all you need are bees, then it's not that bad a time to start. Like you've already made the investment, um, you know where the bees are gonna go, it's just a question of whether there's someone that, that has bees to sell. If they have bees to sell, then it's not too late. You just want to make sure that they have enough time to get enough food for them. It's like your first year doing beekeeping, you might not end up harvesting any honey. Like you might let them keep everything they have that first year because you want to make sure that they, they get strong enough and they overwinter and then the next year start harvesting more. Or if they're doing really well, you can harvest some. It really depends on the hives and how things are going. Um, I think we might need to start moving out 
So yeah, I think, but again, um, up at our, our table, we're gonna be there, happy to answer any questions about beekeeping or pollinating or what we do, anything that you have any interest in. Obviously, we like talking about bees. So thank you guys. I hope I wasn't rambling too much. Uh, it was great having you, and it was a lot of fun for me, so thank you.